tuned and thank you all for coming out. Um, Umfan is a journal of women photographers of the African diaspora. And it started back in 2006 when my co-editor and founder, um, Leila Amatula Belain, who I'm sorry she can't be here today because of personal um, reasons. But back in 2006, um, we, had the, we were looking through the book Committed to the Image and Reflections in Black. Like We were looking at all of these anthologies and we were like, there's nothing that actually chronicles black, uh, well, women photographers of the diaspora. And we said, we need to do that. You know, um, prior to, I guess it was like, at that time, it was like 20 something years before that, when um, Jeannie Matu, Matumi Ash did, Mutusami Ash did the first book, Viewfinders, which was um, women photographers, just black women photographers, pretty much focusing here in the United States. And so we had that as a reference point, but we knew that we wanted to do something that was of the diaspora. Um, we did try to get a book deal back then and we were unsuccessful. I guess people never know how to market these things. I don't know why, but <laughs> that's usually the response that we get. We don't, well, who's your audience? I'm like, you know, <laughs> really? <laughs> So what happened is like during that time period, I started to travel more, Layla started to travel more, and we both were doing these things within the, um, I've like been going back and forth to Nigeria, Ghana, like all throughout the continent doing my own project from since 2008, and every year I'm going. And then Layla's going to Senegal every year, she's going here and there, and we started meeting photographers along the way. And you know, every time I see like another sister with a camera and she's geared up and she's doing her, I'm like, who are you? Let's exchange cards. And then so it kind of happened organically that we kind of got back together again and on this idea and was like, you know what? Let's do a journal this time, you know? And then so with that as a mission, then Layla is like, you know what? Instead of doing the small journal first, let's do 100 women. And we were like, that's our book and then after that we could have the journal and it was it made a lot of sense and then it was perfect sense to name this book I'm fun because I'm fun was a photographer contemporary of you know ours who passed away from breast cancer back in 2001 and her work you know I remember seeing her at hip-hop concert shooting you know we'll give each other the nod and then we both ended up in the um, exhibit committed to the image. So when she passed away on the eve of this exhibit, it was really a big deal. You know, I'll let Crystal kind of tell you a little bit about. Hi. So, uh, yes, as, as Delphine was saying, um, Van was a trailblazing, trailblazing um, photographer. Uh, and her name is called, well, it, it, she is, she's originally from Nigeria, and she's from the Anang tribe, and her name means blessed rose, I think, a blessing. And she really was a blessing. I mean, really, it, it was fun. If you saw her, first of all, you, you were struck dead because she was fabulous and stunning and just made a presence. So when she came in, you were like, you see that picture right there? So that picture in 96, in 97, okay? Way just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, above her time, you know, just a renaissance woman in that, in that regard. And so um, the, the exhibit that, that, that was at the, uh, committed to the image was the Amazon's New Clothes. And what that was, was an exhibit of her after she had had the cancer treatment. So it was semi nudes of her with, with her right breast, which was, uh, the mastectomy was on her right side. I'll still talk about her as you read about her. She's fabulous. So anyway, so, th so when you walked into the exhibit in the Brooklyn Museum, you saw this, and it just struck you. And so um, with that, um, we wanted to make sure that um, all the photographers that were picked for this particular journal all have the, um, the tenacity and the spirit of Mfan, which was, you know, she was courageous and she was just, you know, bold in the gaze of you looking at 
the image, you know, and, 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 and what she did was flip the gaze. So she's making sure that you see her in this state in all of her beauty and all of her boldness. Um, and she was radical and revolutionary in terms of the documentation of her self-preservation during this time. And shifting the power of the gaze. Right. That was right after it, right after the, um, the page where she has the hat on. Cancer. So this is what she, this, this is, this is, and this is why we uh, named this, the, the whole journal, uh, you know, after her. Uh, because really it's in her work she reflects the collective flaw, the collective flaw and sacred beauty of, on our own terms um, as an un undeniable source of strength and ultimate defiance of other standards of beauty. And Fun stands tall and grounded in her dignity and grace as all of our featured photographers in and fun do effortlessly. She's an inspiration as a woman and as an artist in a way that she courageously and triumphantly found and captured beauty in space in spite of and because of creating more room for us to define, defend, and demand truth through our own image. And fun is a vehicle to give voice to our images through our particular and unique lens as black women which reflect the spirit and nod to the genius of Mega Uthan Essien. So as Crystal said, now you see the energy that we had to create this amazing um, project. So what we're gonna do is just kind of quickly go through some of the photographers who are in the book. Um, so like the next slide is, and just a, a glimpse. I mean, we have 118. So we wanted to point out that this book is diverse, not only in location, but also in um, subject matter and genre of photography and age. So um, here we have Lindsay Weatherspoon, and you can advance, she's from Atlanta, Georgia, and Birmingham, and she did this whole um, series on the um, Mardi Gras Indians in New Orleans, which you know is a fantastic series if you get a chance to Google her. And then following this, we have um, Jamie Todd from Queens, New York, who is exploring who's exploring colors, and so she has this whole series of just these abstract colors that are intertwined with each other, more on the fine art spectrum. And then we have Angele Etundi Asambar from the Cameroon, and she's based in Amsterdam, and she has this amazing series. Now the thing about her is that she's a contemporary of Malik Sidibe, and you know, when we think about old school African photographers, how often is her name coming up? But she has seriously paid, exactly, but she has paid her dues and she's still um, making work. Okay, next we have Genevieve Eken, who I actually met in Nigeria and did a workshop with her on, um, I did a workshop with women photographers and it was amazing to see this come out of, you know, seeing her early work, it was amazing to see this. And she's looking at the idea of marriage and what that means in this Nigerian setting. And it's not as simple as every woman should get married. There's so many different layers when you think about the ethnic and cultural aspects versus like a westernized idea of getting married. And it's interesting to see how she plays around with this. And next we have Muna Jamal um, Siala from Tunisia. And she's also exploring the politics of being a woman in Tunisia. And her work is absolutely breathtaking and amazing too. And very, you know, we're dealing with really social and political issues here. And then we have Barrett McCauley, who's from Sierra Leone, lives in um, between Jamaica and Washington. And of course, she's here looking at another thing, you know, in terms of our bodies and the violence and, you know, a bunch of, yes, agency over that. Okay, and then. Now, our oldest contributor is, eldest I should say, she's 93 years old, and Mildred Harris Jackson documenting her family in Harlem during the 20s, you know, having, looking at her archive and being a documentarian, she's, her collection is actually documenting the history of Harlem. 
When, and so it's important when we look at the archive because one of the reasons that we're doing this project is because we have to maintain an archive, you know? We have to because if not, someone else is doing it and telling our story. Exactly, or no one else, right? We're lost in the shuffle somewhere and it never happened when we know it did. And next we have Fanta Diop who is 13 year old, thir a 13 year old based in the Bronx and our youngest photographer. And this young lady is no joke. So she's already been written up in the New York Times on her own, you know, not with us and with us, you know, and she's really just doing her thing. She's very serious and you know, I'm inspired by her. Here she's documenting her grandmother who owns a, a, um, a beauty store in the Bronx. And she's been really documenting her family and the woman in her family. And then um, we have Joanne Raman, who's here with us today. <laughs> Miami and how, oh yeah, she got the other stuff. I'm sorry. And I didn't know you were gonna be here. So we have another rep. Could you stand to introduce yourself? Yes. We have two photographers here in the book. Sorry about that. And then we have, um, yeah, so Joanne's work is really looking again at the Black Florida archive. So it's important to have these archives everywhere to show that, um, I mean, it's just important for our history because when we are looking at art history, sometimes there's no conversation about us. Like we haven't been doing this and we have been. So it's important to have the archive again. And speaking of archives, we're here with Miss Marilyn Nance, who is, yes, please. Because I know my first introduction to Marilyn Nance, and I don't know if you remember this, but my first, one of my first exhibits was in a place in Manhattan, and it was a big deal because Marilyn Nance was gonna be in the show. I was like, okay, I'm exhibiting next to Marilyn Nance. You know, I, this was great. It was on um, through um, black through African voices. She, yes, yeah, she did the curation. Exactly. This is like back in the '90s. Yes, and so yes, and so I had that in my head like for many years, and I've been following the work. And um, so I mean, I could go on and on with all of Miss Nance's accomplishments. Let's see, working photographer since the 70s. She started off um, working at Pratt Institute in the, yeah. Uh -huh. But the interesting thing is because I was looking at the timeline of that and you were no joke because you started freelancing for the Village Voice in 1974, but then by 77 she's covering Festac. I'm like, how did you do that? And you know, so we have to talk about that. So I was like, she wasn't playing around back then. But in the mix of that, she's been published by the New York Times, um, A World History of Photography Anthology, Essence, Aperture. Um, she's in the collection of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and in the Smithsonian National Museum of American Art. And you were named a folklore artist for... Yeah, well, she's recognized by the Smithsonian for her great work. And I could go on and on about Miss Nance's contribution to photography and culture and American culture and world culture. You know, so it goes beyond just, because I don't like to put us like if black history and black cultures in a bubble somewhere. We exist in the world, so definitely. So um, I wanted to ask you a question about just even before we get to Festac, I'm interested in knowing, like back in the 70s, you know, especially after seeing the exhibit, We Wanted a Revolution at the Brooklyn Museum, where you had all of these sisters who were just so strong and having these organizations, things I've never heard about. So I wanted to know what was it like, like during that part, just being a woman and doing what you were doing? Well, um, I, in the 70s, you were just doing what you were doing. and. I always had an affinity towards uh, making photographs because I grew up looking at photographs. I grew up looking at family photographs and that represented for me the, the people in my fam family that I didn't know. So the act of taking photographs was sort of, I knew that I was holding things for the future because there may be some people who didn't know that this happened or that 
that happened but i was also very conscious of the fact that we were not represented or misrepresented and not everybody had a camera then as everyone does now and i knew and i sort of had the feeling that if i didn't take this photograph then it wouldn't be taken it wouldn't be that photograph wouldn't be made so in the seventy's we did have a sense of of history we we did have a sense of we were making history or we were making a revolution and we were going we were doing something and i saw myself very seriously then as a part of that uh... as a part of that history and some people are going to like do cook the food somebody's going to make the molotov cocktail or somebody's going to build the buildings i'm going to make the photograph so that was the role that i assumed for myself and even as a uh, in my family, at family events, I, I remember in 1979, my grandmother passed away. And even though I was an adult then, I was around older adults in my family. And I was like, well, I don't have a role here. And I was like, I'm the family photographer. So I was, I'm the family photographer for black folks. <laughs> <laughs> and Another quick thing before we get into the archive, like that you brought up family, I think it's so interesting to be raising kids and making sure that you're doing your art at the same time and making sure that your kids are doing what they need to be as humans in the world so, and grandchildren. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, one of the things uh, Delphine was talking about was like all of my accomplishments and it sounds like a lot because you're, what, what's happening is she's compressing all of these events that really stretch across a lot of time. I mean, I didn't get this at the shop, you know? <laughs> so there, there's a, you know, so I've been around a long time and I think the, I guess the, the thing that we all have to do is make sure we stay healthy and stay alive because I think staying alive and staying healthy is the best defense and the best way to continue. I mean, um, I have plenty of friends who've passed on, and I'm just glad to be here, even in this moment, for all of the things that are going on, I'm glad uh, to be here. Um, I didn't plan on being anybody's mother, <laughs> you know, that, but somehow I think these children said, mm, those two, I'm going to choose those two people as parents, and um, my first thought when I knew that I was expecting was like, how am I going to, I was working at an ad agency at the time in TV production, but how am I going to do this and do that? And I realized that, you know, that's how all of us got here. I mean, you know, we weren't, we're not here to work in factory. I think uh, on the plantation, we're here and, and what humans do is reproduce and eat. And, you know, so I think it's important that we take care of our human selves and, um, so I thought about that because at first I was like, this is incongruent. <laughs> you know, like, I cannot be a photographer and somebody's mother. And I have a photograph that I made of uh, my husband and my son. It's called Al and Ali. And I really, when I took that photograph, I was channeling the feelings that I had because I still remember being like, you know, even though my dad died when I was really young, I remembered like just sort of being in his arms. And I, when I, when taking this photograph, Al and Ali, I said, this might be the last photograph I ever take, you know, but it, it wasn't. So, but we find ways to do things. We find community and we keep on going. And it's not incongruent to be a parent or, and an artist or a parent and a whatever. Because that's, that's what humans do. So now, getting into Festa. Now, I was really curious about something, because if we think about 66, when the first World Fair took place in um, Africa and Senegal, and, you know, there's a lot of layers with that. First, I wanted to know how conscious and aware were you of, like, what was your understanding of that, com uh, the 1966 one? And what did that mean as you were entering into the, you know, going to do the second um, Black Arts Festival in Africa? Yeah. I don't know if I knew of the 1966 um, uh, festival uh, that was held in Dakar, Senegal. 
I know that I have a book from the library that never got returned, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure about which had the papers of the colloquium of 1966, but I'm not sure if I had that book before 77 or afterwards, but I was really very politically aware because those were the times I had been a, a member of the African American Students Association. We went to rallies, we knew about reparations and Pan-Africanism and, and when I went to Nigeria, I went as an African. But when I got there, I was like, ooh, I'm American. I, didn't, I, I never felt American until I got there. And <laughs> so I, I did have a, a high level of awareness. And we were, at the time, um, South Africa was still under apartheid. So we had a lot of uh, comrades from South Africa who were living in the United States, and we were always interested in things African. So there was a, uh, you know, so when we, there was a chance to apply to be a part of this festival of arts and culture in Lagos, Nigeria, I mean, everyone, everyone knew about it. So I, I applied as an exhibiting artist. And the festival was supposed to happen in 19, maybe 74 or 75, but because of strife in Nigeria and wars. It happened in 1977 and by the time, uh, at the end of 76, I got a letter saying, you know, they had to cut the list of people who had been accepted to exhibit and I had been cut. So I re, uh, I, I, I eavesdropped. So I heard somebody talking, that's how I get my information. Um, I heard someone talking, <laughs> they were looking for technicians and so I reapplied as a technician, and um, so did my buddies. You know, I, I became a photo technician there, and that that was I was on the cadre of the of the festival, uh, the North American Zone, and my buddy uh, Juba Douglas went as a film technician, and she was on the USA film crew, and so that's how we went to Festac as workers. So I photographed and you know, I brought my own film camera. Had, I shot the entire um, festival with one camera, one lens, a lot of film, you know. <laughs> and I was taking, and you know, this is a digital age, but back then we had slow film, fast film, black and white film, color films. So I had slow, black and white, fast, black and white, slow. And so I was constantly taking the film out the camera rolling it back in there <laughs> in the heat. So anyway, so I don't know if you want me to go. I do one more question before. I'm very curious about this because you went during the time of Oba San Sanjo, Olu Shegun Oba Sanjo, who, if you're familiar with the um, activist and musician Bela Kuti, so he, during that time is when he made the song Zombie, which was very critical of the Nigerian government at the time, who you know was doing all types of atrocities. So I'm so curious to know, what was the conversation on the ground? Like, was there anything? First of all, did you experience him, Fela, when you were there? So I want to know what that conversation, like what was going on? Because you got like Stevie Wonder, you got Sun Ra, all these people who are coming with this, and, and like you said, like this idea of what Africa is, and now you see what Africa is, and I want to know, like, what was the political vibe? Well, well, we knew that there had been some conflict. Now, we knew Fela's work because we would party with Fela and dance like all night, and to, you know, well, I, I don't make me sing, but anyway, we knew Fela's work. <laughs> and um, so when we got there, like, we were excited that we would, you know, meet Fela, but he was not going to be part of the festival because of, you know, and there were even ads in the paper, like I'm not going to be part of, and I've got, I, I still have the archive, I really do. When, when I say archive, I'm very serious. People thought that I was just like, oh, yeah, you have archive. I really seriously, I have had curators and collectors come over and say, I've never seen a photographer this organized. So. I have, I have stuff, and I've been very serious about that always, as a, you know, and people make fun of me, but, <laughs> you, know, you know, so, um, so when we, um, so we did have an opportunity to uh, go to the shrine and 
meet with Fela, like even before going to the shrine. And um, he, would, he was willing to meet with folks, you know, and you can come to the shrine, but he was not going to become part of, of Festat, you know, so they had. Like just being six when she was going there, I look at, I'm getting goosebumps because I'm like, oh my God, you were just vibing with Fela like that. You got the photos, like, so, you know, as, as photographers, you are just, you know, I'm looking at these photos and like, oh my gosh, you know, just the. I know. Yeah. I know. People are like, you shot Biggie. I'm like, yeah, but it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it is, it is. But still, you wanted to get a photo of like the young Stevie and Sunra. Oh my God. Okay, so not. Mm. Yes, yes. It's true. It's true. It's true. That's why I was shooting like crazy in the 90s. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Someone um, asked me what, yeah, what, you know, what was it like? What were your, some of your challenges as a woman photographer? And I don't really see challenges. Um, I mean, of course we do have challenges, but the more you talk about your, you know, negative stuff, the more you sort of bring it to you. So my, the only challenge that I could speak of was that, I, and I thought, I said, well, I'm short. Right. And so, um, you know, when, photo, and I was a photojournalist and like you're photographing the news and the events is back there and there's all these big men and you're, like, you're trying to get the shot. You've got to get the shot. So I would find ways that were uniquely my ways to, to make a photograph. I went between legs. I did whatever I had to do, you know? Um, so those were the challenges. I mean, basically, more or less physical challenges. Those things that people who have problems with other humans have, that's secondary because what comes first is the work, right? And you just do it. So can you take us through your oh, video? Okay. So, um, so this photograph has become iconic of Festat because when I got back home, I think within a year or the next year, I made a postcard. Someone scanned the postcard, put it on the internet, and now it was all over. You know, uh, but I was there to take photographs, but no one assigned me to do anything. So I just did my own thing. I just walked around and photographed different contingents. And this was a Nigerian contingent. And all of that texture up there, those were people. Um, next, uh, Festat, what was Festat? That's, Festat was a convening of artists and um, performers from all over the African diaspora. From There were African artists from Sweden and Australia. It, it, at that point, or, you know, the Aborigines who we'd always been, you know, dark skin would put into the category, at least politically, as being African people. North Africans were there. And I've been finding out more about the political climate in Nigeria. And I've been told that North Africa was included in Africans because before they were not African because of oil. So there were lots of geopolitics going on, which I wasn't really aware of. I mean, I not even so much what was going on with Fela. We, we knew some things, but we didn't know the whole thing. We went just wanting to touch, you know, other Africans and talk to Zambians and South Africans and people from Senegal. So a lot of my photographs are just like one-to-one. -one. They're very intimate. So there, there may be some, you know, other representations, but when I look at my work, I see this is people wanting to, you know, meet each other. Uh, next image. Oops. 
so uh, the USA contingent had, there were 400 of us. Uh, and what prompted me to do, I mean, there are different stories I could tell about FESTAC, but one of them is that all the artists that went were like really prominent artists, but we don't learn about them in art history. So, <laughs> the, and this was at the point where the second contingent, we came in two contingents, I guess about 200 and 200, and the second contingent was coming in on a jet, and the first contingent was gonna return to the USA on that same jet, and we actually had a chance to meet and trade notes and things like that. Um, so you can imagine what she might have been saying. I, I wish, I wish I had a recording. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, the actually the closing ceremony, um, and this was a group. Uh, I thought it was Wajumbe, but it's Symbol Wachanga. Now in the opening ceremony all the Americans got on the field and we saw all the other contingents and they were all dressed alike. And we were like, oh, we were supposed to have this together? We didn't have it together. We didn't know what we were gonna sing or chant. Someone says we sang amen. And I, I, that sounds plausible, but by the second contingent, it was a little bit more together. And these are some of the artists that, um, that when we were actually waiting to make a trip to uh, the Yaba Institute of Technology, which in Lagos is a place where a lot of artists get uh, are trained. And I made sure that I wrote the names of the people down because even if I say it, you know, it's that way I hope, hopefully people are like scribbling names down to Google later. So this is one of my goals in, in showing the work enter uh, these artists into the black and the black arts movement into art history. Now I'm told that the black arts movement was the largest arts movement in the US. We don't study that in school, but I wouldn't have studied it because I guess I was too close to it, but I'm, I, don't, I wonder if it's being studied now. No, oh, okay. And then, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so Jeff Donaldson was the, uh, the, the head of the North American Zone of FESTAC. So my thought was to make some um, cards and something like flash cards and with the art, representing the artist with a photograph of taking at FESTAC and a sample of their work. It wasn't, this was before Jeff Donaldson did his um, one man show, he's passed away now and we could only find little tiny JPEGs online of his work. So um, I worked with my daughter, who's also a photographer and digital, all digital, Rafia Santana, and she pretty much took some JPEGs and stitched it together to form the background for this work. So this was a collaborative work between me and my daughter. So, you know, we raised in the work on the farm pretty much. And, <laughs> And while the interesting thing is, while working on this, she got engaged in his work because how would she, she would have never known about this artist prior to, prior to her having to be, you know, employed working with the work. Next, Charles Searles. We did the same thing with Charles's work, stitching it together. Uh, Joe Delaney, uh, Ellsworth Osby. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because these are the people, these were, they weren't even really my contemporaries. They were my, not elder elders, but I was, when I went to Vestac, I had just turned 23. <laughs> and they were like 30 something. And, and so right now that um, I went recently to see Viney Burroughs, who was at Vestac. She's a performer. She's 94. And the oldest person who I knew who was at Vestac just had his 100th birthday. And my mentor, Valerie Maynard, is 80. So all of the people who went to FESTAC are old. I was the baby. I mean, there were younger ones because Harlem Children's Theater was there. But I was one of the younger ones, and I'm a senior citizen. So like, it's, 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 it's interesting to see that continuum. Next. 
And this is my buddy, Ajuba Douglas. She's an industrial, or she passed away also, an industrial designer. And I included her because it, otherwise you would not know her name. And uh, we uh, went to Pratt together. And it's really so important when you go to art school that you form a, a you know, some people work with, and we were from the days when we would work together and like, hey, you know, it wasn't about like, I'm gonna go to Festac and you're not. It's like, I'm going and you're going and I'm gonna make sure that you go and, and that's how we both got there. Charlotte Carr, ooh, one person's still alive. But um, let's see, what are some of the other artists who were there? Um, Carol Bayard was there. Um, Adamola Alugbefola, uh, Viola Burley, Winnie um, Owens, who is a potter. Winnie and I uh, and a group of artists traveled out to uh, uh, Ife, Ile Ife, and uh, Benin City. And outside of Ile Ife, Winnie uh, was introduced to a uh, a village of women potters, and she eventually went back and studied uh, with them. Samela Lewis was, was one of the um, people who was sort of running Festac. Uh, next, Valerie Maynard. Who is Valerie Maynard, for anyone who may be um, in and around Baltimore, has a show in Baltimore that's up until December 22nd. Charles Abramson. And Carol Bayard and Tyrone Mitchell. Tyrone is still alive. Carol Bayard passed away just this year. Winnie Owens. Uh, Ohinero, Frank Smith, and Valerie Maynard. Now, Ohinero was one of the protocol. Like, there were young people who, maybe they were art students who were guides, and everybody liked him, and he took us to his town, uh, Benin City, in Nigeria. And we stayed in his house. And so anyway, I have a, um, on Instagram, I have three Instagram accounts. One is Festac 77 Archive. And I posted this photograph and someone said, that's my older brother. So that's why, so we're kind of coming of an age where, where you know, we can share work. Um, so it would be interesting. I was supposed to have been part of Lego's photo it, with this work. But, but that, drop, that part dropped out of Lagos photos. I have a real interest in bringing these images back to Lagos. Next. Um, Adamola and Napoleon Jones Henderson. And that was me. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <That was me. laughs> by these larger than light sculptures at the Yama Institute of Technology that you know I took I have a lot of photographs of these sculptures and I don't know who I asked to take a photograph of me but this is this is me and I'm wearing a shirt that says okra is an African word which was uh, which was I had a set of t-shirts banana is an African word okra is an African word um, I, st I forgot what the series was mm -hmm. Ooh. Right. Yeah. So I was trying to include me in art history too. I was going to put my name in there. Uh, uh, Sun Ra was there, and I was just walking to do my laundry without my camera, and I was just like transfixed. I, I knew Sun Ra's work, but I was transfixed by it. And I was like, I should go back and get my camera. So I went, and they, they rehearsed forever. So I went back, got my camera, and they were still rehearsing. I have a whole maybe three or four rows of just Sun Ra and his uh, orchestra. Stevie Wonder came to visit Festac Village one evening. They also have photographs of him performing. And this was, these were people waiting to get in on opening, um, opening day of Festac. Nigerian sailors, Nigeria has a Navy. And previous, uh, like so just to catch up on what, like I've been, Festac is 40 years old and for 40 years I've had these contact sheets and you know, I may have circled some and, and printed some, but for the most part I didn't know what images I had other than what I had printed. 
So in, what is this, 2017, I think it was in 2016, um, you can go on to the next slide. I made, a, uh, I made myself print every image of uh, from good, bad, and different because I just wanted to see what I had done 40 years later. And so now I have, uh, next slide, my effects like box set, which, which is like 14, uh, 1, 495 images, four by six reference prints with the file numbers on the back. And so I'm, I'm sort, of, sort of compiling my box set and just figuring out what else I need to do. Um, maybe for, if a library wants to purchase or something like that. So I'm still conceptualizing that, um, that box set. And that's pretty much where I am now. Um, if anybody wants to, um, like any images, I have the negatives, but I have, when people say, did you digitize everything? I kind of did a rough digitization just to do these reference prints, but you don't have to digitize everything. You just digitize what needs to be used, you know? Um, well, the way I did it, all of my um, negatives are in plastic sheets, which, you know, which I, uh, so I have a negative sheet, which I have used to make, to generate the contact sheet. So previous to having those prints, I had scanned each contact sheet. Um, but then what I did is I took the negative sheet and I did like a really high, high, high resolution scan of the negative sheet so that I could, um, at least make like a four by six image. And I actually didn't do the work. I took the work up to light work because I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't like working. I really don't. And you know, if I can keep someone alive, so I'm always like trying to get money because I'm always like putting money out there. So I don't want to do the work. I want to sit and play with the grandbaby. I want to be on the beach, you know? And <laughs> if somebody needs money, here's some work for you to do, you know? <laughs> while I'm in the kitchen, like, cooking okra or something, you know? <laughs> you know? So, so these are, um, so I'm on Instagram, and I have a lot of fun sharing on Instagram, just because, and I do it sort of hap, not haphazardly, but when I go through the archive and I find something, I'm like, oh, wow. And one of the things I found on, that I posted on Instagram was, um, there had been some talk about the CIA's involvement in the USA FESTAC participation. And the, fest, the festival, which was held in 1966, was pretty much sponsored by the USA government. And the USA government chose the important people who they wanted to represent the United States. But FESTAC 77 was chosen by the people, and they really fought with the State Department to include people like me, and, and you know, nobody was going to bring me to Africa, but there was a grassroots movement to bring people to um, Lagos, Nigeria, and so we didn't know when, we, we really didn't know, when we got to Lagos, there were soldiers with machine guns, I mean, we knew that it was a contested space, but we just kind of went anyway. Some people didn't know what it was going to be like and didn't go, but I was like, it's a free trip to Africa? <laughs> Yay. So I went and it was free food the entire for 30 days, medical care, housing, I mean, <laughs> sort of a, sort of a no-brainer. Um, something else I was gonna say about uh, the, the environment, oh, CIA. So in going through my archive, and I have like things like the board, my boarding ticket, even the envelope that my boarding pass was in, and it made me think about when we got to the airport and we saw the plane, and we, it wasn't Air Nigeria, it wasn't Pan Am, it wasn't, well, there was no JetBlue then, it wasn't America, it wasn't Eastern, the TWA, it was this thing called Capital, and we were like, what, it, what is that? Some kind of charter, and then when I saw the, uh, the envelope that my boarding pass was in, the, the envelope said Capital International Airways, C-I-A. <laughs> that, that's what I said, wow. So I put that on Instagram, because it was like a wow moment for me. So who knows? I don't think the, the, we know the whole story yet, because 
their ways of looking at FESTAC from the point of view of oil. Nigeria had a lot of Naira, because of, um, which is their unit of currency, because they had a lot of oil. And I don't know what all the forces were. All I could, could speak for was this young person who gets a chance to go to Africa. Africa, you know, so I can talk to Africans and be African, you know. So that's, you know, so it stops just a little bit of the story, but I'm sure there's lots more that could be said. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, and it's also important too, like even thinking about today, the communication and lack of communication within the diaspora, you know, and that's another reason why we did in Quan is to have these conversations, because I know when I'm going back and forth, I'm always trying to meet and just talk to people and see how can we kind of bridge this gap over the, the you know, over the, the, the waters, you know, make it happen. But thanks everyone for coming out and sharing. Does, does anyone have any questions? Well, we do want to say that we have copies of them fun that we would like to get rid of and not lug back with us to New York. So they're $35 a piece. It's a collector's item because they're going fast. So if you can get your hands on it now, that would be great. Thank you all for coming out.